Thank you for joining us today for the reading of the Word of God. We strive to always present the Word of God as it is presented in the NIV Bible. Keep us in your prayers as we pray for you all as we engage our Lord and Savior in this amazing journey in the reading of the Bible. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're diving into a topic that every Christian needs to be aware of, spiritual warfare. Whether you realize it or not, there is an unseen battle raging all around us, and it's not for land or power, but for souls. Ephesians 6.12 ESV says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And that's so key, Darius. Many of us go through life not fully prepared for this battle, or even worse, unaware of it. But spiritual warfare is real, and we need to understand the enemy's tactics and how we can stand firm in Christ. Today, we'll be talking about the misconceptions Christians often have about spiritual warfare, the enemy's strategies, and how to apply God's word to fight and win this battle. Let's start by clearing up some common misconceptions about spiritual warfare. First, there's the idea of binding the devil. You often hear people say, I bind the devil in Jesus' name. But does scripture really give us the power to do that? That's a great question. When we look at Matthew 18:18, 18, 18, which talks about binding and loosing, the context is about church discipline, not about binding spiritual forces. Nowhere does the Bible say we have the authority to bind Satan directly. Instead, James 4:7 tells us to resist the devil. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So it's not about binding him, but standing firm in resistance through God's power. And that's key. We are called to stand firm. Ephesians 6, 13 to 14 tells us to put on the full armor of God so we can stand our ground. The power belongs to God, not us. Similarly, people often talk about putting the devil under our feet, quoting Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. But notice, it's God who does the crushing, not us. We are victorious because of his power, not ours. So let's get into the enemy's strategies. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul warns us not to be ignorant of Satan's schemes. One of his primary weapons is deception. Remember in the Garden of Eden, Satan questioned God's word by asking, did God really say, Genesis 3.1, he distorts the truth to lead us away from God? Yes, and he also uses discouragement. Satan whispers lies like, you're not good enough or God doesn't love you. And it's easy to believe these when we're going through hard times. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus tells us that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to destroy our peace, our joy, and our faith. Exactly. Another tactic is distraction. Satan fills our lives with busyness and noise, so we're too occupied to spend time with God. He even uses good things like work, family, or hobbies to distract us from focusing on Christ. Hebrews 12.1 reminds us to lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And don't forget discontentment. Satan loves to make us feel like what we have is never enough. He plants seeds of envy and bitterness, pulling us away from the contentment we find in Christ. Philippians 4, 11 to 13 reminds us to be content in all circumstances, trusting in God's provision. So how do we fight back? Paul gives us the answer in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, the armor of God. Let's break this down. First, the belt of truth. In a world full of lies and deception, God's word is our foundation. 
John 17:17 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We have to be grounded in scripture if we want to stand firm. Next, the breastplate of righteousness. This guards our hearts against the accusations and attacks of the enemy. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 tells us that righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. When we live righteously, we protect ourselves from sin's influence. And then there's the shield of faith. This is our defense against doubt, fear, and discouragement. Hebrews 11, one defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Our faith in God's promises is what extinguishes the fiery darts of the enemy. Right, and finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is our offensive weapon. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. When we speak and apply scripture, we push back against the forces of darkness. Let's not forget the power of prayer in this battle. Ephesians 6.18 says to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Prayer is how we stay connected to God, our source of strength, and how we intercede for others who are also in the fight. Absolutely. Prayer is both our offense and our defense. It's how we draw on God's power to resist the enemy, and it's how we invite God's will to be done in our lives and the lives of those around us. James 5.16 reminds us that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So how do we apply all of this to our daily lives? First, we need to recognize that we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus has already disarmed the powers and authorities triumphing over them by the cross. Exactly. This means that every day we live in the confidence of Christ's victory. We stay grounded in the word, we pray continually, and we trust in God's power, not our own. When trials come, we don't have to panic or give in to fear. We can stand firm in the truth that God is in control. And practically, this looks like making time for prayer and Bible study daily, staying aware of the enemy's tactics and resisting him by standing firm in the truth. It also means encouraging each other in the faith, reminding ourselves and others that we are not alone in this battle. Before we close, let's remember that spiritual warfare is a daily reality, but so is the victory we have in Christ. Stay vigilant, stay equipped, and above all, stay connected to the source of your strength, Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the victory we have in Jesus. We ask that you strengthen us for the battles we face each day. Help us to put on your armor, to stand firm in your truth, and to resist the enemy's schemes. Guide us by your Holy Spirit and remind us that the power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in us today. We give you all the glory and trust you in every battle. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today with hearts filled with gratitude for this opportunity to gather and share in your word. As we dive into the significance of the Jewish feasts and their deep spiritual meaning, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. May your Holy Spirit move through this conversation, enlightening our minds and opening our hearts to understand how these feasts reveal your plan for redemption, not just in ancient times, but for our lives today. Lord, we pray for our YouTube viewers that you bless each and every one of them as they watch this video. May they gain a greater understanding of your love and your provision. And may this discussion encourage them in their faith journey. Let our words be pleasing to you, Father. And may they bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen.
Welcome everyone. Today, we are diving into a fascinating topic, the agricultural cycles of the Jewish feasts. These feasts hold significant spiritual and cultural meaning in the Jewish tradition and can offer lessons applicable to people today. Absolutely, Janet. The seven Jewish feasts as outlined in Leviticus chapter 23 are deeply rooted in both the history of the Israelites and the cycles of planting and harvest. They reflect a profound connection between faith and the natural world. These feasts are not just historical events, but are also tied to the agricultural seasons in Israel. They provide a rhythm that mirrors the cycles of nature and the spiritual journey of the people. So let's take a closer look at these seven feasts and their connection to the agricultural seasons in Israel. Let's briefly introduce each of the seven Jewish feasts as outlined in Leviticus chapter 23. First, we have Passover or Pesach. Next is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, also known as Chag Hamatzot. Then comes the Feast of First Fruits, or Yom Habit Kurim. Following that is the Feast of Weeks, also known as Shavuot. The fifth feast is the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah. Then we have the Day of Atonement, which is Yom Kippur. And finally, we have the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot. These feasts correspond to the agricultural year in Israel, divided into spring and fall harvest seasons. Each feast carries its own unique significance and lessons. Let's start with Passover. This feast marks the beginning of the Jewish religious calendar and commemorates Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Agriculturally, it coincides with the early barley harvest. Yes, and the spiritual significance of Passover for Christians today is also profound. It symbolizes Christ as the Passover lamb whose sacrifice brings salvation. Together, we can explore the practical lessons from Passover, freedom from bondage, the importance of redemption, and how this feast can be a time of reflecting on personal deliverance in modern spiritual life. The Feast of Unleavened Bread follows immediately after Passover and symbolizes the Israelites' haste in leaving Egypt, not having time for their bread to rise. This feast is also symbolic of removing sin, or leaven, from one's life. The practical lesson here is about living a life of purity and spiritual renewal. The Feast of First Fruits is all about thanking God for the first crops of the barley harvest. In biblical times, it represented the first of the harvest being offered to God in faith. This feast connects to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, noting that he is the first fruits of those who have risen from the dead, as described in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. The Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, takes place 50 days after first fruits and celebrates the wheat harvest. In Jewish tradition, it also commemorates the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. In Christian tradition, Pentecost represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, bringing a spiritual harvest. The lesson here emphasizes spiritual growth and the importance of thanksgiving for God's provision. The gap between the spring and fall feasts is, well, quite significant. This waiting period mirrors the agricultural cycle, a time of growth and anticipation. Yes, and it can also be seen as a metaphor for spiritual patience and faithfulness. Just as the land rests and prepares for the next harvest, we too are called to rest in our faith and prepare for what's to come. Indeed, Janet. 
This period reminds us that in our spiritual journey there are times of waiting and growth, times that require patience and trust in God's timing. The Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, marks the beginning of the Jewish civil year. It's a time of reflection and repentance, preparing for the Day of Atonement. And the blowing of the shofar during this feast signals a time of awakening. It's a call to spiritual readiness, reminding us to be prepared for God's future plans. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. It's a solemn day of fasting and repentance, a time to seek forgiveness and make amends. For Christians, this feast can be seen as a powerful reminder of Christ's atoning sacrifice. It calls for deep introspection and a renewal of one's commitment to living a godly life. Absolutely, Janet. It's a day that underscores the importance of repentance and the profound grace that comes through faith. The Feast of Booths, or Sukkot, was a harvest festival celebrating the final ingathering of crops. Historically, it commemorates the Israelites wandering in the desert and living in temporary shelters. This feast points to God's provision and the importance of living with a sense of gratitude for His protection and sustenance. These feasts, while deeply rooted in Jewish tradition, offer timeless lessons for Christians and people of faith today. Modern believers can apply these lessons to their lives, including themes of deliverance, faith, repentance, and thanksgiving. Thanks so much for joining us today. We encourage you to dig deeper into the meaning of the feasts and see how they apply to your walk with God. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and join us in the comments to discuss your thoughts on these feasts. We'd love to hear how these biblical lessons resonate with you. One way we can apply the Passover lesson today is by reflecting on Christ's sacrifice as our ultimate Passover lamb. Just as the Israelites were delivered from physical slavery in Egypt, Jesus' sacrifice delivers us from the slavery of sin. Every day we can take moments to remember that our salvation is a gift of grace, not something we can earn. It's a reminder to walk in freedom and live out our faith boldly, just as the Israelites followed God out of Egypt. Exactly. And in our daily lives, we can practice gratitude for our spiritual freedom. Maybe this means setting aside specific times in our day or week to meditate on God's redemptive work in our lives, or simply thanking Him when we pray, acknowledging how He has led us from darkness to light. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is a beautiful picture of how God calls us to a life of purity. Leaven, or yeast, represents sin. Just as the Israelites were instructed to remove all leaven from their homes, we are called to examine our hearts and remove anything that leads us away from God. In a practical sense, this can be applied by daily repentance. Each day, we can reflect on our actions, thoughts, and words, and ask God to help us remove anything that doesn't honor Him. This could be pride, anger, selfishness, or any other sin that we might overlook. It's about allowing God to cleanse us so we can live a life that's spiritually pure, just as the unleavened bread was free of yeast. The Feast of First Fruits teaches us to give God the first and the best of what we have. In ancient times, this was the first of the harvest. Today, we can apply this by offering the best of our time, talents, and resources to God. It's about putting Him first in everything we do. Exactly. 
Whether it's starting our day with prayer and scripture, or using our talents to serve others, giving God our first fruits means we prioritize him above all else. It's a reminder to keep God at the center of our lives, recognizing that all we have comes from him. The Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, reminds us of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Just as the early church received the Spirit on this day, we too have access to the Holy Spirit's power in our daily lives. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That's right, and we can apply this by living in the power of the Holy Spirit. Whether we're at work, at home, or serving in our communities, we can ask the Holy Spirit to guide us and give us the strength to be witnesses for Christ. In practical terms, this might mean listening for the Spirit's prompting, or simply being bold in sharing our faith with others. The Feast of Trumpets is a time of awakening and preparing for God's judgment. In our daily lives, this reminds us to stay spiritually awake and ready for Christ's return. We don't know when that will be, but we're called to live in a state of readiness. Living with this awareness can change how we go through each day. It encourages us to make decisions with eternity in mind. It might mean being more intentional about sharing our faith or simply ensuring that we're living in a way that honors God, knowing that we're accountable to Him. The Day of Atonement teaches us about repentance and the seriousness of sin. It's a time of deep reflection and confession. For us today, this means taking time to come before God with a humble heart, confessing our sins and receiving His forgiveness. Yes, and this is something we can do regularly. In a practical sense, it might mean setting aside specific times in our prayer life to ask God for forgiveness or even participating in a personal fast to seek spiritual clarity and repentance. It's about understanding the depth of God's mercy and responding to it. The Feast of Booths, or Sukkot, is a reminder of how God provided for the Israelites during their journey in the wilderness. Today, it encourages us to trust in God's provision in our own lives especially during seasons of uncertainty. In a practical sense, this could mean being content with what we have, trusting that God will provide for our needs. It might also involve finding ways to remember God's faithfulness in the past to fuel our trust for the future, maybe through journaling or sharing testimonies with others. So each of these feasts holds a timeless lesson. Whether it's about trusting God's provision living in purity, offering our best to Him, or staying spiritually awake. These are all principles we can apply to our daily lives. Yes, and as we move forward, we can ask ourselves how we're living out these lessons. Are we giving God the first of our time and talents? Are we removing the leaven from our lives? Are we staying spiritually ready? These are important questions to reflect on as we seek to live out our faith. By integrating these points throughout the discussion, Darius and Janet can offer their audience clear, practical ways to apply the ancient lessons of the Jewish feasts to their modern-day Christian walk. These applications encourage reflection and daily practice of faith principles. Prayer after the discussion. Janet. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of fellowship and learning. Thank you for revealing to us the depth and beauty of your appointed feasts and how they point us to Jesus, our Saviour, who fulfilled every promise and prophecy. We pray that the lessons we've shared today will take root in the hearts of our viewers drawing them closer to you. Lord, bless our YouTube family and everyone who has joined us in this discussion. 
may they be encouraged and strengthened in their faith. Continue to guide them through every season of life, just as you have guided your people through the wilderness, the harvests and the celebrations. Let your presence dwell with them and bring peace, joy and hope to their lives. As we go our separate ways, may your love and light shine brightly through us all. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Welcome back, everyone. Before we begin our deep dive into the book of Daniel, let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with open hearts, eager to understand the profound truths found in the book of Daniel. As we explore each chapter and the messages within, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. Help us to grasp the significance of these teachings and how they apply to our lives today. May our discussion be enlightening and encouraging to all who listen. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, Miriam, let's get into the book of Daniel. This book is packed with profound messages, especially regarding end times and God's sovereignty. Yes, Mark, the book of Daniel is truly fascinating. It's filled with visions, prophecies, and stories of faith that are still relevant today. Absolutely, Miriam. Daniel's unwavering faith and the divine revelations he received offer us deep insights into God's plan and his unwavering control over history. What do you think life was like for Daniel and his companions during their time in Babylon? Life was certainly challenging for Daniel and the Israelites. They were taken captive and exiled to Babylon, which was a powerful empire steeped in idolatry and pagan practices. The pressure to conform to Babylonian culture was immense. Exactly. In chapter 1 we see how Daniel and his friends Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah resolved not to defile themselves with the royal food and wine. Their commitment to maintaining their dietary laws shows a profound dedication to God. That's right. Daniel's choice reflects his faithfulness and trust in God, even in a foreign land. In Daniel 1 verse 8 it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. This sets the tone for the entire book, remaining faithful to God amidst trials. And God honors their commitment by granting them favor and wisdom. It's a great reminder that when we stand firm in our beliefs, God will support us. Absolutely. Moving to chapter 2, we see King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which troubled him deeply. He demanded that his wise men interpret the dream without telling them what it was. This illustrates the futility of relying on human wisdom. Yes. Daniel, through prayer, reveals the dream and its interpretation. Daniel 2 2022 states, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons he deposes kings and raises up others. This emphasizes God's sovereignty over earthly kingdoms. It also highlights that God reveals mysteries to his faithful servants. The dream signifies the rise and fall of empires, culminating in God's eternal kingdom. This is a powerful message about God's ultimate control over history. Moving on to chapter 3, we see the fiery furnace incident. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego refused to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue, showing incredible courage and faith. Their response is so profound. In Daniel 3-17-18, they say, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods. 
That's the essence of faith, trusting God regardless of the outcome. Even in dire situations, they stand firm, knowing that God is able to save them, but also accepting that his will may be different. And God does deliver them. This incident serves as a reminder of the power of faith in God and the importance of remaining steadfast in our convictions. Moving to chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, this time about a great tree that is cut down. Daniel interprets it, warning the king that his pride will lead to his downfall. Indeed, Daniel 4-27 says, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. This shows Daniel's heart for Nebuchadnezzar, urging him to repent. But when Nebuchadnezzar fails to heed the warning, he experiences a period of madness, illustrating the consequences of pride. Eventually, he recognizes God's sovereignty, emphasizing that God humbles the proud. Chapter 5 presents the story of Belshazzar, who disrespects God by using the sacred vessels from the temple for a feast. The handwriting on the wall serves as a divine judgment. Exactly. Daniel 5 verses 26 to 27 state, This is what these words mean. Many, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. The message is clear. God's judgment is inevitable for those who defy him. Moving on to chapter 6, we see Daniel in the lion's den. His commitment to prayer leads to his arrest, but God protects him. Daniel's faithfulness is again a central theme. Even when faced with death, he refuses to stop praying. Daniel 6 verse 22 states, My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. This exemplifies God's ability to deliver his faithful servants. It's a powerful reminder that faith in God can overcome any fear or threat. Daniel's life serves as an encouragement for us to remain committed to prayer and trust in God's protection. Now as we move to chapters 7 through 12, Daniel experiences visions and prophecies about the end times and the future of Israel. Chapter 7 speaks of four beasts representing kingdoms that will arise, and the last beast is particularly fearsome. Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 to 14 describes the coming of the Son of Man, a messianic figure who will establish God's eternal kingdom. This prophecy is significant for understanding God's plan for redemption. In chapter 8 we see the vision of the ram and the goat, which symbolizes the conflict between the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks. This chapter emphasizes that God is in control of history and that his purposes will prevail. Absolutely. And in chapters 9 and 10, Daniel prays earnestly for the restoration of Israel, reflecting his deep concern for his people and God's promises. His prayers demonstrate the importance of intercession. Daniel chapter 9 verse 19 captures this beautifully. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. It emphasizes God's desire to restore his people when they turn to him in repentance. In chapter 11, we see further prophetic details about the future kings and conflicts. The specificity of these prophecies reveals God's sovereignty over history. Mm. 
And finally, in chapter 12, we find prophecies about the end times, the resurrection of the dead, and the ultimate victory of God's people. Daniel 12, verses 2 to 3, states, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens. This is a profound promise of hope for believers. As we consider the themes throughout the book of Daniel, it's essential to recognize that God revealed these things to encourage and prepare his people for what lies ahead. Exactly. Daniel's writings emphasize God's faithfulness, sovereignty, and the importance of remaining faithful in the face of adversity. In today's context, we can apply these principles by prioritizing our relationship with God, standing firm in our faith, and seeking to understand His will in our lives. And as we observe the world around us, the lessons from Daniel remind us that while times may be difficult, God is still in control. His plans will ultimately prevail. As we conclude our discussion on the book of Daniel, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the insights we've gained from the book of Daniel. Help us to apply these lessons to our lives, remaining steadfast in our faith and trusting in your sovereignty. May we be inspired by Daniel's example of courage, prayer, and commitment to you. We pray for spiritual growth among our listeners, that this discussion sheds light on the importance of following you in these challenging times. If they found value in today's message, may they smash the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more uplifting content. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Before we dive into today's discussion, let's take a moment to invite God's presence and guidance. Heavenly Father, we come before you with grateful hearts, seeking wisdom and understanding as we explore the rich history of your people in the book of 2 Kings. Help us to discern the lessons within these scriptures and to apply them to our lives today. May this discussion honor you and inspire others to deepen their relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The book of Type Kings provides an essential narrative of the history of Israel and Judah during a tumultuous period marked by political upheaval, social injustice, and spiritual decline. Spanning from the death of King Ahab to the Babylonian exile, this book presents significant events, rulers, and the people's relationship with God. Tucker Kings serves as a continuation of Born Kings and chronicles the consequences of the divided monarchy established after King Solomon's reign. Understanding this historical backdrop is crucial to grasping the events and themes of the book. The divided kingdom following Solomon's death around 930 BC the kingdom split into Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. This division led to differing spiritual paths and political struggles. Israel had a succession of kings, most of whom are described as evil, leading the nation into idolatry and rebellion against God. Judah while experiencing more righteous leaders, also had its share of ungodly rulers. Political climate. During this period, Israel faced external threats from neighboring nations, particularly Aram, Syria, and Assyria. Internal conflicts, coupled with the failure to adhere 
to God's commands weakened the nation significantly. Jehovah has reigned 814, 798 BC. Son of Jehu, Jehovah has ruled in Israel during a time of oppression by Hazael, king of Aram. His reign exemplified the consequences of turning away from God. 2 Kings 13, verse 2 states, He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. His inability to seek God resulted in Israel's suffering. Jehoash reigned 798-782 BC. The son of Jehoahaz, Jehoash attempted to restore Israel's strength, but ultimately fell into idolatry. Despite military successes, his reign did not lead the people back to God. The narrative highlights the prophetic ministry of Elisha, emphasizing the spiritual decline in Israel and the impending judgment due to unfaithfulness. Jeroboam II reigned 793-753 BC. Known for his military accomplishments, Jeroboam II expanded Israel's borders and restored its power. However, he continued the sinful practices of his predecessors, including the worship of golden calves. The prophets Amos and Hosea warned during this period, calling for repentance and highlighting the impending doom due to Israel's idolatry and social injustices. Uzziah reigned 700 92-740 B.C. Uzziah, or Azariah, was a king of Judah who experienced significant success and prosperity. He fortified cities and expanded territories. Despite his accomplishments, pride led to his downfall when he attempted to burn incense in the temple, a role reserved for the priests Seder Chronicles 26, verses 16 to 21. Hezekiah reigned 715, 686 BC. Hezekiah is celebrated for his faithfulness to God. He initiated significant reforms, removing idols and restoring temple worship. His actions brought spiritual renewal to Judah. During his reign, the Assyrians threatened Jerusalem, but through prayer and reliance on God, Hezekiah witnessed a miraculous deliverance. 2 Kings 19, verses 32 to 36. Manasseh reigned 686-642 BC. Manasseh's reign is characterized by extreme idolatry. He worshipped foreign gods, sacrificed his son, and engaged in various pagan practices leading the nation further away from God. His actions prompted divine judgment, leading to serious consequences for Judah, including eventual exile. Josiah reigned 640-609 BC. Josiah is remembered as a reformer king who discovered the Book of the Law during temple renovations. His reforms included the removal of idols and a renewed covenant with God. Josiah's reign exemplifies the power of repentance and returning to God's word, showcasing how true reform can lead to restoration. the worship of foreign gods. Throughout the book of 2 Kings, the Israelites repeatedly turned away from Yahweh to worship various foreign gods. Some of these included Baal, a prominent Canaanite deity associated with fertility, storms, and rain, often worshiped through rituals 
that included child sacrifice and sexual immorality. Asherah, a goddess represented by wooden poles or sacred trees, worshipped alongside Baal. Her cult practices involved sexual rites and immorality. Moloch, a god associated with the Ammonites, worshipped through child sacrifice. The practice was explicitly condemned in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 21, reflecting the abhorrent nature of such worship. Kamash, the god of the Moabites, who also required child sacrifices. His worship influenced some leaders of Israel, promoting idolatry, golden calves, established by Jeroboam I to deter the people from worshiping in Jerusalem. These calves represented a major turning point in Israel's spiritual decline. Impact on Israel's relationship with God. The continuous cycle of idolatry and rebellion had severe consequences for both Israel and Judah. Divine judgment. Prophets like Elijah and Elisha warned of impending judgment due to the nation's unfaithfulness. Their messages often went unheeded, leading to dire consequences. The ultimate consequence of Israel's idolatry was the Assyrian conquest in 722 BC, leading to the exile of the 10 northern tribes. Judah's struggles. Judah, while having some righteous kings like Hezekiah and Josiah, also experienced periods of severe decline under evil kings like Manasseh. The corruption and idolatry led to God's judgment through the Babylonian exile, beginning in 586 BC when Jerusalem was destroyed. Prophetic Voices Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea warned of the consequences of idolatry and called the people to repentance, emphasizing that God would ultimately restore his people. Spiritual decline. The constant turning away from God resulted in a lack of spiritual discernment among the people, leading to social injustice, moral decay, and a general sense of hopelessness. Theological implications. God's covenant. Throughout 2 Kings, the narrative emphasizes God's covenant relationship with his people. Despite their unfaithfulness, God remained faithful to his promises, often sending prophets to call them back to him, call to repentance. The repeated messages from prophets indicate God's desire for his people to repent and return to him. This theme resonates throughout scripture and serves as a reminder of God's grace. Lessons for today. The stories within 2 Kings serve as a warning for modern believers about the dangers of idolatry and the importance of remaining faithful to God. It emphasizes the need for personal and communal accountability in faith, importance of righteous leadership. The contrast between the righteous and evil kings shows how leadership affects the spiritual health of a nation. Good leadership guided people towards God, while poor leadership led them astray. book of 2 Kings provides a vital narrative that illustrates the consequences of turning away from God. 
the reigns of various kings, demonstrate a continual struggle between faithfulness and idolatry, affecting not only the political landscape, but also the spiritual well-being of the nation. As believers today, we can learn from these lessons, recognizing the importance of staying true to God's Word and valuing relationships that honor Him. By prioritizing a life aligned with God's will, we can foster a strong foundation for future generations and a deeper relationship with our Creator. This extended discussion includes a more detailed examination of the events and themes in the book of 2 Kings, emphasizing their relevance for modern audiences and providing a deeper understanding of the historical and theological context. Concordance Explanation, The Life and Times of the People in 2 Kings. Cultural Context, 1. Religious Practices. The culture of ancient Israel and Judah was heavily influenced by their covenant relationship with God. However, over time, idolatry crept into the nation, leading many to worship foreign gods such as Baal, Asherah, and Molech. The worship of these deities often included immoral practices, rituals, and sacrifices including child sacrifice, which was explicitly condemned in the Mosaic Law, as stated in Leviticus 18.21. 2. Societal Structure The society was patriarchal, with kings wielding significant power. The monarchy influenced not only the political landscape, but also the spiritual direction of the nation. Prophets played a crucial role as God's messengers, calling the people and their leaders to repentance and faithfulness. Their presence often challenged the status quo, especially during times of idolatry. 3. Political Turmoil The divided kingdom experienced instability, with frequent changes in leadership and ongoing conflicts neighboring nations. The Assyrian Empire became a significant threat, ultimately leading to the conquest of Israel in 722 BC. The internal strife and leadership failures in Israel and Judah served as a backdrop for the prophetic warnings of impending judgment. 4. Moral Decline The repeated cycles of sin judgment, and repentance depicted in 2 Kings illustrate a nation struggling with moral and spiritual decline. The contrast between righteous and evil kings significantly impacted the nation's relationship with God. Social injustices flourished, particularly in Israel, where the poor and marginalized were often oppressed by the ruling classes. Key takeaways for viewers. One, God's design for relationships. The narrative emphasizes that God created marriage as a sacred covenant. Understanding the sanctity of this union is vital for modern believers navigating contemporary relationship dynamics. Hookup culture, which promotes casual relationships, contradicts God's intent for intimacy, leading to emotional and spiritual consequences. Two, consequences of idolatry. The people's tendency to worship foreign gods serves as a warning against allowing modern distractions and false idols to take precedence over a relationship with God. Believers today must evaluate what influences they allow into their lives, and how those influences align with biblical teachings. Three, the role of prophets. The prophets in 2 Kings highlight the importance of accountability and spiritual guidance. 
They encourage us to seek wise counsel and to listen to God's voice in our lives. Just as God sent prophets to call Israel and Judah back to him, he still calls his people today to live in accordance with his word. Four, hope for restoration. Despite the prevailing idolatry and rebellion, the message of repentance and hope is central to the narrative. God's willingness to forgive and restore his people emphasizes his grace and mercy. This offers encouragement to viewers who may feel distant from God. It's never too late to turn back and seek his forgiveness. Five, legacy and leadership. The leadership examples in 2 Kings illustrate the profound impact that individuals can have on their communities. Righteous leadership is essential for guiding a nation or community toward God. Viewers are encouraged to be leaders in their own spheres of influence, modeling faith and integrity in their relationships. The book of 2 Kings serves as a rich historical narrative that provides profound lessons for believers today. Understanding the cultural context, the nature of idolatry, and the importance of faithful leadership encourages us to align our lives with God's will. By prioritizing our relationship with God and seeking His guidance, we can foster a culture of faithfulness that honors Him. Let's pray together as we wrap up our discussion. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to explore the rich lessons from the book of 2 Kings. We ask for your guidance as we seek to understand your design for our lives and relationships. Help us to remain faithful and to guard against the distractions of this world. May we model our lives after the examples of faithful leaders and heed the warnings from your word. Encourage our viewers to seek you earnestly and to foster a deeper relationship with you. We pray that this discussion inspires them to share our content and engage with us. If they found value in today's message, may they hit the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more uplifting discussions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This comprehensive overview combined with the closing prayer should help your viewers feel informed, inspired, and encouraged to engage further with your content. Heavenly Father, we come before you with open hearts, seeking understanding and wisdom as we delve into your word. As we explore 2 Kings 1, may we grasp the lessons within and how they apply to our daily lives. Help us to recognize your authority and power and to align our lives with your will. We pray for our listeners that they may find encouragement and inspiration through this discussion. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going off to consult Baal-zebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will not leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. What kind of man was it who came to meet you and told you this? Man of God, the king says, Come down, if I am a man of God. May fire come down from heaven 
and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Man of God, this is what the king says. Come down at once. If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his fifty men. Man of God, please have respect for my life and the lives of these fifty men, your servants. See, fire has fallen from heaven and consumed the first two captains and all their men, but now have respect for my life. This is what the Lord says. Is it because there is no God in Israel for you to consult that you have sent messengers to consult Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will certainly die. So he died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Because Ahaziah had no son, Joram succeeded him as king in the second year of Jehoram's son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. As for all the other events of Ahaziah's reign and what he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? The book of the second kings is traditionally attributed to the prophet Jeremiah, although some scholars suggest it could have been compiled by other prophets or historians. The intended audience is the people of Israel and Judah, particularly those in exile or facing the repercussions of their ancestors' actions. The historical narrative aims to instruct them on the importance of fidelity to God. The chapter begins after King Ahab's death, highlighting the spiritual decline in Israel, especially under King Ahaziah, who seeks guidance from Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, rather than turning to the god of Israel. The prophet Elijah confronts Ahaziah questioning why the king sought help from a foreign god instead of seeking the true god. The narrative illustrates the futility of idolatry and the consequences of turning away from Yahweh. Ahaziah's death serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of spiritual complacency and reliance on false idols. Key Themes 1. The authority of God. The chapter emphasizes that there is no other God besides Yahweh and that turning to idols leads to destruction. 2. Judgment for unfaithfulness. Ahaziah's decision to consult Baal, Zebub instead of seeking God leads to severe judgment, showcasing the serious consequences of unfaithfulness. 3. Prophetic role. Elijah's unwavering commitment to delivering God's message serves as an example of prophetic integrity and courage. Verses Overview, verses 1 to 2. After Ahab's death, Moab rebels against Israel. Ahaziah, injured from a fall, sends messengers to consult Baalzebub for healing. Cultural context. Seeking help from foreign gods was a common practice, reflecting a lack of faith in Yahweh. Verses 3 to 4. Elijah receives a message from God 
instructing him to confront Ahaziah's messengers and question their reliance on Baal Zebub. Theological insight. This highlights God's desire for his people to turn back to him and seek his guidance rather than relying on idols. Verses 5 to 8. The messengers return and inform Ahaziah of Elijah's prophecy, identifying him as the Tishbite. Leadership impact. Ahaziah's failure to heed God's prophet illustrates the consequences of rejecting divine guidance. Verses 9 to 14. Ahaziah sends captains to retrieve Elijah. The first two captains are consumed by fire when they demand Elijah come down. Divine Power This display of God's power underscores the seriousness of his authority and the prophet's role as his messenger. Verses 15 to 17 The third captain approaches Elijah with humility, and Elijah goes to confront Ahaziah with God's message of impending death due to his unfaithfulness. Lesson for today Humility in seeking God's direction is crucial. Approaching God with respect opens the door to his grace. Verses 18, Ahaziah dies as prophesied, and Joram, his brother, succeeds him as king. Consequence of actions. The fulfillment of Elijah's prophecy reinforces the notion that choices have eternal consequences, shaping future generations. As we wrap up our discussion on 2 Kings 1, let's pray together once more. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons learned from the life of King Ahaziah and the prophetic ministry of Elijah. Help us to recognize the importance of seeking you above all else, to turn away from any false idols in our lives. May we be faithful to your word and live in accordance with your will. We pray that our listeners have found this discussion insightful and encouraging. If they enjoyed today's content, we ask them to smash the thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more discussions like this. Should they have any questions, or scriptural interpretations to discuss, we invite them to engage with us so we can grow together as a community. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We send our blessings to you in the name of Jesus Christ always. Your presence in the next reading of God's Word would be highly appreciated Be there. We await your involvement with excitement.